Series, for those who are not familiar with it, have been running since the ECTASOC Youth Forum with uh, wonderful assistance from our friend Khalid. Um, we've had uh, member states present, members of civil society, and a number of youth constituencies who have joined us. And of course, this all has been around the theme of building back together for COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 agenda. We've had three goals th throughout the series. First has been to appreciate the progress that has been made in increasing youth participation in multilateral spaces. We have been exploring gaps um, that still exist. And we have also really tried to create a space where we can deliberate together about the future of youth participation in the decade of action. So it seems to be fitting actually that the last session of this series also happened on a day when the UN had a consultation around the creation of a UN Youth Office. And I know that many of you today were in that, were in that uh, meeting. And I hope that as we speak, that our insights about this consultation will inform our conversation because we would like to put out a, a paper from the series that really talks about what are we learning about the increasing youth participation? How can this be of service to the creation of this UN office and also fit into other conversations that are happening at the UN about issues of governance, issues around the youth peace, um, uh, youth peace and security and other important items that uh, young people are advocating for in multilateral spaces. So your participation is very important to us and we're really looking forward to hearing your insights. So today's focus, uh, we'll be talking about partnership for the goals. And many of us are engaged in a number of partnerships uh, within multilateral spaces. And um, although in, when we look at SDG 17, it talks about how each country is primarily responsible for its own social and economic development. Um, that these national efforts have to be, at the same time, these efforts have to be supported and indeed are reinforced by enabling environments created through multilateral cooperation, whether that cooperation is economic, whether it's through trade or sound and befitting governance structures. So today we'll be exploring how we create enabling environments for young people to be able to contribute to multilateral structures as a core national implementation of the SDGs. So when I think about um, what these environments might look like, these enabling environments might look like, I also think about who the actors are in these spaces or who these protagonists might be. And so I think about three, three protagonists in this um, story that we're all writing together. The individuals themselves, communities and institutions. So it is clear today that all of these are interdependent and a paradigm that assumes conflict between them would not enable any of them to create thriving societies that alone create enabling environments for the participation of young people. So we really need to fundamentally shift how these three protagonists interact with one another. So the barriers to youth participation have been well articulated and many of you have spoken about them at length. Um, I, I would recommend for those who are still learning about this area to look at the 2017 MGCY publication called Principles and Barriers for Meaningful uh, Youth Participation, and I can share this later on in the chat. Um, and this really outlines a number of barriers that youth face, and I'll just include a few of them here because these may be familiar to some of us when we think about the, the nature of these spaces. So individualism and the creation of celebrity youth in the, in the, in the UN space and how that limits um, these spaces from really uh, drawing from the full strength of the, of the large youth networks that exist. Lack of political will and lack of understanding on how to meaningfully engage young people in developing, implementing and reporting on um, agendas such as climate action, for example. Um, and we still have rigid systems that hold outdated and false notions of the capacities of young populations. And this inevitably leads actors in the systems to really underestimate young people. Um, and this engagement has to be tokenistic, marginal, unclear, and without adequate resourcing, information, support, and guidance. All of you are very, very familiar with this. Yet today, um, we see before us uh, a large network of young people that's composed of hardworking, dedicated, reliable individuals who are striving to strengthen solidarity between one another, who are building relationships of trust uh, with member states who are ready to work with them, who are striving to foster a community that is both loving and supportive among themselves and their colleagues. And throughout the past week, and also working with, with many of you, I have experienced and witnessed this working with, with all of you. And this is something that we can benefit from as actors within the multilateral spaces. So how can we move forward 
knowing very well the challenges that young people face. So I think collectively, we can focus on building meaningful cooperation between generations. We can contribute to creating lasting strategies that ensure intergenerational cooperation and collaboration, and then to ensure that this becomes more common and more explicitly valued and, and sought. And this, collaborate, this cooperation can be distinguished by the willingness of youth to in turn be inclusive of all groups and collaborators in the spaces that they're active in. So this happens um, when, when these, these enabling environments are fostered, maintained, and protected intentionally by a community of actors. So we're, we're all uh, individuals in different communities, and we all exist in different neighborhoods, I, I will call them. So these are the various coalitions, uh, working groups, task forces, and committees that make up the international community. And so these, um, these meaningful partnerships contribute to sustainable development processes. And these spaces have a number of characteristics that I'll just describe. They are open to all willing participants. They are spaces where young people are treated as equal stakeholders in policy development and implementation processes. They are driven by an iterative process of consultation, action, and reflection that ensures that we create systems that remain relevant, that we're not just recreating and imitating processes that don't work. Um, these are spaces where one's opinions and positions can change as understanding defense, both as individuals grow and develop as professionals in their fields and as new facts and developments come to light. So these are just a few examples of what an enabling environment might look like. And I'm sure that as we continue our conversation today, we will come up with many more examples and they will feed into this document that we're writing. So lastly, I'll talk about the last protagonist, which is the institution uh, around us. So the institution of the UN, its agencies, and also the institutions of the member states have much to gain in opening their doors to young people who have built the capacity to articulate the intersectionalities of the issues they are advocating for. By fundamentally changing their relationship with institutions, young people can ensure that the system of uh, systems of policy, programming, and governance are um, can also benefit from their full contributions and that we pave a new way for new generations after us to engage with these institutions. So as much as young people have a lot to learn about what this change should look like, member states, the UN and its agencies also need to consider what are the fundamental, <coughs> fundamental changes they need to make internally to ensure that um, we are advancing and understanding meaningful youth um, participation. So all of these protagonists have responsibilities. Youth and civil spaces have an opportunity to bridge gaps that exist between multilateral spaces and the grassroots. They can be the connective tissue that not only relays information from the international to the grassroots, but organizes for coordinated action, builds um, incredible, agile, and effective networks for consultation and policymaking, many of which you're all already doing today. And the various actors in critical uh, the various actors in this critical moment of history have an immense responsibility to learn from past experiences. So what is it that we have done in the past? What has worked, what has not worked? Are we acting with full knowledge of this? Avoid repeating harmful behaviors and put in place frameworks that allow for reflection parallel to action, that we are acting in full knowledge of what we've done in the past. So we have a great panel today who will expand on their experiences of creating partnerships in the multilateral space. Um, they will speak to how current spaces can be reconfigured to ensure meaningful engagement of youth. They will also talk about what meaningful engagement can look like. We have a wonderful panelist who unfortunately was not able to join us from Barbados, um, who is embarking on a really uh, amazing partnership with the Prime Minister's office and actually today is um, going to be meeting with the cabinet of, of that government um, because their funding is being reviewed. So it's, it's unfortunate for us, but really good for them and the young people that they work with. Uh, but she has sent a recorded message. And uh, the panelists will also speak about how youth can be increasingly involved in shaping together with older generations, decision-making spaces. And lastly, on how can the diversity of perspectives from among various group ages uh, strengthen our ability to invest the SDGs. So with that, I will hand it over to our first speaker, Ms. Hawa Diallo, who is the Chief of the Civil Society Unit at the Civil Society and Advocacy Section of the UN Department of Global Communications. And we will share Hawa's bio uh, in the chat of why she's speaking. Over to you, Hawa. 